case on this morning's docket. Case number 107957, State v. Reed. It please the court. My name is Carl Mon. I represent Michael Reed, the appellant in this case. Your Honor, may I preserve three minutes for a vote? Three minutes is granted. I'd like to uh, focus my arguments today on, on uh, three issues and, and rest uh, the remaining issues on the, on the briefing. I'd like to focus on the felony murder instruction, the deficiency thereof, the sufficiency of the evidence on each alternative means argument, and then the denial of uh, additional instructions uh, if we get to that. Uh, Your Honor, with regard to the felony murder instru instruction, in this case, the court used the standard pick instruction for felony murder. Uh, however, I would suggest that under the specific facts of this case, the pick instruction was deficient to the extent that it denied the defendant his right to trial by jury on the issue of whether the underlying felony was sufficiently distinct from the act of the homicide. And what's your support for the idea that that's a question of fact rather than a question of law? Well, I don't have any uh, legal citation other than what's in the brief, Your Honor. However, when we look at uh, how the facts come out, this is an inherently a factual de decision-making process as to whether or not uh, the underlying aggravated battery uh, was merged with what was part of the act of the homicide. It is a, the only way to decide that is to look at the facts and the evidence of how it c comes out. The evidence of uh, how the, the, uh, the fight in the apartment developed and uh, so it can only be decided by a jury, because otherwise we are making the we're making legal decisions that are inherently reliant on the facts. And the jury is the, the finder of fact in this case, and they weren't given the opportunity to make that point. I'm not sure if I can. There, well, there are lots of situations in which a judge makes a legal determination based on underlying facts. I mean, the voluntariness of a confession is sort of a, a classic. Uh, well, um, that, that, that is true in pretrial settings. Where there are, and those are constitutional issues regarding pretrial. Well, the case we just talked about and whether somebody should be given instructions, um, that there a judge is making a legal ruling based on the facts underlying, whether, whether there's enough for a jury to consider something. I mean, those, those kinds of things happen all the time, pre-trial, during trial. But when it goes to the uh, element of the crime and stuff, the, ad, the underlying felony cannot be a, under, a, an inherently violent crime unless certain facts exist. And so in order to prove the element of the underlying inherently violent crime, you have to prove that the... the uh, the battery was not so consistent and so merged with the act of homicide uh, that, the, that the acts were. Well, let's talk about the facts for a second. Here, they were beating the guy up, and then he got shot. The lethal act was the shooting, not the beating, right? That's correct. Uh, well, I, and that's, yes, the, the, the autopsy showed death by, 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 by the uh, gunshot, right? Um, however, this was an ongoing fight. Uh, yes, there, there are the facts, the evidence is somewhat uh, uh, inconsistent on that. But there is evidence of the uh, blunt force trauma from the actual physical fight, and there's obviously evidence of the gunshot. But there's evidence that, that uh, the shooter didn't even know that the gun had gone off. Uh, the placement of, of the gun uh, suggests that this the gunshot occurred during the, an ongoing physical altercation. Uh, this wasn't something where the, uh, the shooter stepped back and then shot the person. Uh, they were so close and so uh, upfront uh, in contact with each other that it suggests that there is a 
uh, ongoing physical altercation. I'd also talk, uh, look at situations such as the Sanchez case where... Uh, well, let's go back. I want to go back before you get off on that, uh, back on the legal versus the factual. Uh, you, you just laid out what some of the facts were. It seems like to me if you have a preliminary hearing and you're determining whether a felony has been committed and whether it's a probable cause, and at that particular point the court has to take the facts that are presented and plug it into the statute, which is really a, a statutory interpretation, to determine whether a felony murder has been committed. And that seems to me that the underlying facts sure are factual, but whether those facts constitute a felony murder um, or not, because the inherently dangerous felony uh, uh, has is different, is separate, or has merged. You understand what I'm saying? I, I'm still having my heart I just, getting my head around that the jury would basically sit there uh, acting as a judge at a preliminary hearing determining whether these facts constitute this crime. Well, first of all, Judge, at the preliminary hearing, the judge is both the finder of fact and the finder of law. Uh, so it's slightly different there. I uh, guess the, the judge at the prelim does take the, the facts and apply them uh, to the law and decide, is there probable cause to believe that, that the crime occurred? Uh, at a jury trial, though, the jury is the uh, determiner of whether or not the elements of the crime occurred. And it's not just whether or not an aggravated battery is. It's whether or not an aggravated battery occurred, which was sufficiently distinct from the act of homicide. And so it, the, the, you cannot decide these without uh, delving directly. That's a legal point. Whether the, the aggravated battery was sufficiently distinct uh, uh, so as not to merge is a legal question. That's not a fact question. It doesn't matter who was holding the gun. Whatever. It, it, here's, here's these facts. And applying that legally, uh, does that merge or not? I, I would disagree. I, you can only decide that by looking at the facts and, and determining uh, how the, the evidence unfolds. And so I, I would simply suggest to the court that uh, the issue of whether or not uh, the aggravated battery was an inherently violent, an inherently dangerous crime uh, in the setting of these facts is an issue for the jury. And I would, would ask that uh, the court reverse on, on the issue. So, of so you would, there's no current instruction that Correct. espouses your position here, is there? That's right. So, so, uh, so the court would have to fashion in certain circumstances an instruction that would be consistent with your theory yes. here? I, I think because it's so fact specific, um, I would suggest that uh, pick, the PIC instruction is deficient uh, for these type of facts. Um, and yes, the, the district court judge is, is uh, encouraged to follow PIC. Uh, however, when the facts uh, suggest that, that the law shows something else, uh, the, 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 jur the court should... It, it, let me just step back. It, it is the duty of the trial judge to make sure that the instructions clearly and sufficiently state the law. And in this case, under these facts, the PIC instruction did not do that. So yes, the burden would be on the trial judge uh, with the assistance of counsel to uh, fashion a, an instruction uh, that is sufficient, sufficiently uh, advised the jury of the law. And you have no case, there's no precedent for doing that I, I think, until now. No, I think this is an uh, issue of first address. And if we don't agree with you, that torpedoes your next issue on sufficiency of the evidence. Right? Well, it makes it a lot harder. <laughs> I, I would recognize that. Um, because obviously if the court disagrees with me, then it's not uh, what you're saying is it's not an element and, and the jury did not need to, to decide that. Uh, so certainly uh, it becomes a lot harder to argue uh, that issue. However, I, I would 
I'm not going to abandon the idea that there was sufficiency of evidence on uh, the uh, on the underlying felonies there. First of all, the possession of cocaine, or the attempt to possess co cocaine. The question here is whether or not when they arrived at, at the apartment to engage in flight, had they abandoned the idea of getting uh, cocaine, were they simply there to address what appeared to them to be a uh, disrespect from, uh, this, from the deceased. Um, and so I would suggest that there's insufficient evidence to show that the uh, possession of cocaine uh, underlying felony uh, exists here as well. But also, even the aggravated battery. Did you make that argument in your brief? No, you yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, even on the aggravated battery, when we start talking about it, if, the, if the gunshot and the battery become too uh, distinct from one another, then the question is whether or not the gunshot actually occurred during the, uh, the, the aggravated battery. So uh, again, we get to the point where uh, it is, the, is it the fight that is the aggravated battery, or is it the gunshot? Um, and the gunshot, obviously, I think I might be get, getting back into the other issue. But it certainly does become harder to, to argue the sufficiency of the evidence. But I would suggest to the court that under the facts of this case, um, where the issue of whether or not the, the aggravated battery by the gunshot and the uh, homicide merge uh, is something that ought to be uh, considered by the jury and therefore also on the sufficiency of the evidence, which if they didn't have the opportunity to consider it, they didn't have the opportunity to uh, decide whether it was proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Judge, I would like to uh, address very briefly, I've got about uh, 30 seconds, the uh, lack of uh, voluntary intoxication instruction. Uh, in this case, Judge, there was uh, some, a lot of evidence that uh, Mr. Reed, Mr. Robert Reed, was highly intoxicated at the time. Uh, the underlying felony of possession of cocaine uh, would be a uh, specific intent crime, and that the Failure to give the voluntary intoxication instruction uh, was an error in this case. Mr. Moon, yes. what was the evidence um, of impairment such that a voluntary instruction, uh, voluntary intoxication instruction, would have been appropriate? Uh, I'm distinguishing impairment from consumption. Okay. Uh, and I, I think the you are correct. Ron. The the evidence was about consumption. Uh, the Conclusion based upon um, using your common sense and experience would be that somebody who consumed that amount in the time period, which is part of the evidence, would be impaired. Uh, and so I, I would argue that the evidence of consumption and the time period during which consumption occurred uh, implicitly uh, is evidence of intoxication. I am out of time, Your Honor, if there's no further questions. Let, let me ask one yes. other further quick question. The state had raised a jurisdictional argument um, based on restitution being left open. At least that's what I understood. And I think we might be missing some things in the record. Um, orders having to do with restitution on uh, January 23rd, 2012, and then June 25th, 2012. Do you know? Uh, you, you know, Your Honor, I don't. Okay, point, maybe you can check when you sit down. Or... I, well, I, I don't you know, have I it could, with you. I, I don't have. have okay. The, the I'll visit with the state about it. Thank right. you. Thank you. Any more questions? Thank you, Counsel. Thank you. May it please the court and counsel, Assistant District Attorney Matt Maloney for the state. Um, and starting with that restitution issue, Your Honor, the state, in light of the case law that has developed since um, these briefs were filed, the state's prepared to waive that argument. I okay. think in light of the more I recent I think you can case, waive a jurisdictional argument, but you can abandon it. We, we're, correct, yes. We're, we're not interested in pursuing that because I think that the case law decided since our brief was filed clears that up. And I think that what happened in this case is, is sufficient. 
uh, beginning with issue one, and clearly issues one and two are closely tied, as Justice Johnson indicated. Um, starting with issue one, though, there is one distinction between the two issues, and that is with respect to issue one, uh, an invited error analysis applies to this, uh, with respect to how it was constructed upon. The felony murder instruction that was given was the same instruction that the defense requested in substance. The defense did not only not object to this instruction, but it actually requested the, the, the instruction that the court gave. And as I cited in the brief, the case law, including this court's recent case law, is clear in indicating that invited error analysis does apply to instructional issues. And so our, our primary position with respect to issue one is that because defendant got the very issue that he requested, that this issue is not properly before this court. He cannot complain about an instruction that he asked the court to give. Um, if this court does determine that the issue is somehow properly raised, I think that would mean that the clearly erroneous standard would apply because at the very least we know that he did not request the instruction. And I think your your honors have made all of the points that I planned on making in respect to this argument. The state's position is that this is a legal, not a factual issue. Um, the issue of whether the underlying felony is so distinct from the murder so as to not merge is a legal determination. And while I understand counsel's argument that it necessarily does involve some factual considerations, I think, as your court, as your honors have pointed out, there are numerous scenarios in which the district court is called upon to make legal determinations based on a review of the facts. Multiplicity being one, um, as Justice Byer pointed out, suppression as another. Justice Johnson noted that at a preliminary hearing, the court has to make decisions based on the facts that are ultimately legal conclusions. Um, our position is that it is not an element, it's not something that is a factual determination that is to be instructed upon. Um, when you look at the actual felony murder statute that defines the elements of felony murder, this issue of whether it's distinct from the murder is not present. It's simply not an element of the crime, and it's not something that the jury should be instructed, instructed upon. Um, while certainly in no way abandoning that argument, I would also note that it would not be factually warranted in this case. Um, unlike Sanchez, which is the case that the defense relies upon um, largely, this is a situation where it was clear, the evidence made clear, the gunshot was what caused the, the victim's death. That was completely separate from the injuries that he suffered as a result of the physical beating. In Sanchez, it was not clear what caused the victim's death. And that was what drove the court's opinion in that in, in the Sanchez case. Here it's uncontroverted that it was the gunshot that caused the death. The, the blows that were inflicted during the beating had nothing to do with the victim's death. And therefore, even under a factual analysis, this instruction would not have been warranted on the facts of the case. They had nothing to do with it other than being roughly contemporaneous. Sure, yeah, they were close together in time, but otherwise they were separate acts, and therefore the instruction wouldn't be necessary, and especially in light of the fact, as Justice Rosen pointed out, that the defense is acknowledging that this there's no support for this. This is an argument he is essentially raising for the first time. There's nothing, no precedent indicating that such an instruction is warranted. So I, I'd be hard-pressed to find how the district court could have not only erred, but committed clear error in failing to give an instruction that has never previously been authorized. Um, turning to issue two would simply incorporate the arguments that I've already made with respect to issue one, and I would agree with Justice Johnson that if this court agrees with um, the state's position that this is not a factual determination, but a legal one, then the defense argument on issue two uh, cannot succeed. Was there any evidence on whether they still wanted the cocaine when they got to the apartment? I 
Unfortunately, because the issue was not raised by the defense, I'm not prepared to intelligently okay. answer that. I don't think that there was any indication that they had abandoned that desire. I think it's clear from the testimony that the whole reason that they were trying to contact the victim is because they wanted cocaine. Um, while it's possible that by the time they got to the house, they also planned to beat him up in addition to getting the cocaine, I don't think that they ever, um, that there's nothing to show that they did in, abandon that original intent. And so they certainly could have both goals in mind. They could want, want their cocaine, but also plan to rough this guy up because he didn't answer the phone. Um, but I'm not aware of any in, in evidence that they did abandon that desire. Uh, the remaining issue that the defense touched on, I believe, was the uh, voluntary intoxication. Um, our position is, and this is, I'm a little bit unsure as to, as I reviewed my brief, I'm a little unsure as to whether that type of an instruction would be appropriate um, in light of the fact that felony murder itself is not a specific intent crime. Now, the defense is correct that the underlying possession of cocaine charge is a specific intent crime. However, as this court knows, the state is not required to prove the underlying felony in a felony murder case. And so if we're not required to prove the underlying felony, um, I don't know that the defense can say that then there has to be an instruction on um, voluntary intoxication because we need to prove the elements of the underlying crime of possession of cocaine. So I think there, there's a question legally as to whether um, that instruction would ever be appropriate based on the underlying felony. Um, in addition, from a factual perspective, um, as Your Honor pointed out, this is like a lot of cases that we see where there is evidence, some evidence of consumption of alcohol, um, but that is far from sufficient to, in, to necessitate an instruction on voluntary intoxication. In this case, we have evidence that the defendant knew exactly what he was doing that night. He wanted cocaine. He was able to drive a car. He remembered the events of the night. Um, simply put, the fact that he had been drinking is, is not sufficient to warrant an instruction on voluntary intoxication in this case. Um, unless there are questions, I would submit the remaining issues on the brief, and the state would respectfully request that the defendant's conviction be affirmed. Any questions? Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Uh, may it please the court, I'd like to address the uh, issue of invited error here. And it is true that uh, defense counsel did request uh, this instruction and did not object to it. Uh, however, I would again point out that the court is the gatekeeper uh, and it is the court's obligation to ensure that the jury instructions clearly and adequately state the law. And uh, while, especially when this is an issue uh, that, that is specific to the facts, I would suggest that uh, even with the uh, request, of the pick instruction by the defense, uh, the court uh, has an obligation to review that and determine whether or not that pick instruction adequately states the law. Uh, I would also take issue with the question of whether or not the uh, clearly erroneous st standard applies here. Uh, I would argue that uh, the court should review this under the de novo review standard. Uh, we are talking about, about a fundamental constitutional right uh, to uh, to a jury trial and to a finding of uh, proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And those require some legal analysis, and I would ask the court to uh, review the, the, that issue under the de novo review standard. Uh, at one point, Your Honor, during counsel's argument, there was uh, a question about, I think Justice Bias said that these were completely separate acts of the, the battery and uh, the gunshot. And I, I don't think the evidence shows that. Uh, there is. The, the evidence is inconclusive as to whether or not uh, there was any break in the action. Uh, the fact that there, there was such physical proximity at the time of the firing of, of the gunshot does not preclude the possibility that uh, Mr. Robert Reed, the person who actually did the shooting, uh, was 
actually involved in the physical altercation and perhaps using the weapon, the, the gun, uh, to deliver blows, uh, physical uh, blunt force blows. Uh, this was a struggle that ongoing while Mr. Reed had the gun in his hand. Uh, he had taken the gun out previously and fired in the air uh, and still had it in, in his hand when the physical altercation occurred. And so I, I don't think the evidence shows that this was two separate and distinct acts. But the evidence does suggest that there's at least a possibility that the gun went off during the physical altercation and wasn't necessarily an intentional uh, shooting of, of, of the gun, but simply something that occurred as part of the struggle. If I could just go back to this issue of, of, uh, of the elements. Uh, the element of felony murder is not simply death and an aggravated battery. It's death and, and, an, and an inherently violent felony. And the, we can't look at whether or not the aggravated battery is an inher inherently violent felony just by looking at those elements. We have to look at the statute uh, that requires that the battery be uh, distinct from the act of homicide. And I would ask, that, I would suggest that, that is a factual finding, and I would ask for to reverse Mr. Reed's conviction and remand the case for a new trial. So, if the state had charged that Mr. Reed um, had committed the crime of, of uh, littering and a death resulted during the commission of that crime, it's up to the jury to decide if, if that's an inherently dangerous felony? Or wouldn't the uh, court be the one to say, as a matter of law, that charge fails? Well, well, clearly that's a matter of law because littering is not listed in the statute. Uh, the statute does provide uh, for a factual finding uh, in order for aggravated battery to be inherently violent. If there are no further questions, I submit to could I clarify yes. on the dying declarations or the victim statements or whatever you want to call it? Is that a hearsay issue or a confrontation issue? I would suggest it's both. And it's raised that way, both ways. Or I, I was having, I was a little unclear of how how it was. Before. And we we've, we've indicated they aren't they aren't synonymous. Well, that that's true. And, and Judge, I, while I do appear on the brief, I, I didn't write the brief, and I. Trying to remember, I was focusing in my preparation of oral arguments on these other two issues, and I, I can't remember exactly how it was raised. I think the defense argument below was confrontation, and then the brief up here is more about the hearsay. Yes. Uh, well, you know, I, I think it, uh, it it does implicate both issues. Um, and, and the uh, state below argued the hearsay rules, and then there was a ruling right. by the district court. So. Right. And so when we raised it on, on appeal, uh, we were appealing issue that was decided below. Any more questions? Thank you, counsel. Thank you, Ron. Thank you both for your arguments this morning. Court will take this matter under advisement. That concludes.